Good morning and welcome to Summerland Baptist Church Online. My name is Lacey Dawn and I am coming to you today from my kitchen as we're all adapting to do things differently yet again. Even though we're not meeting in person today, I am so thankful that we can meet together virtually for worship in the Word this morning. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus the Anointed One is always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Over the past two years, the ground underneath us seems to have been like shifting sands, unpredictable and unreliable. And it's easy to get caught up in this instability in our world, to dwell on and grieve the things we've lost, whether it be jobs, a sense of normalcy, our stability, friends, whatever it is. But God, God is not unstable. The world has changed dozens of times over. Empires have risen and fallen. Rulers have come and gone. The world has been subject to change from the very beginning of time. But God, God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as we are grieving, as we are fearing, as we are wondering what's next, let's remember to focus in on what has never and will never change. God remains constant, and he is the one who holds you in his hand. Isaiah 41, 13 says, After all, it is I, the eternal one, your God, who has hold of your right hand, who whispers in your ear, do not be afraid, I will help you. Thank you, Jesus, that we can look to you and that you are the same as you have always been and you are sovereign and you are good. Help us to focus our eyes on you and let us be renewed by the strength your spirit gives us. Amen. Well, as many of you are aware, we have pivoted once again and are going to online only for all of our services and programs here at SBC. We do have online content for you uh, for adult ministries. The Eyes on Truth uh, Thursdays at 1.30 are gonna live stream and then that will be available for you to watch. Our Sunday mornings are obviously going online and SBC Kids has online videos as well that you can watch and that has been coming out previous to this. It has not gonna stop, it's gonna continue. And so you've got SBC Kids videos, you've got Eyes on Truth live stream, Sunday morning live stream. And then we also have Right Now Media, which you can get into as far as looking for Bible studies and things like that. So if you want help getting onto Right Now Media, you just have to get a hold of the office, talk to Kareen, and she will give you the information. Now, this wasn't an easy decision to make, but with the spike in cases, and I know Pat is going to talk about that in a little bit, uh, it was just, I think, wise for us just to pull back have a three-week circuit breaker, uh, and then once we get into February, we'll reevaluate. But our plan is, at this point, is to go back to in-person programming and services as soon as we can. We have to see what the new public health order is going to be, which comes at the beginning of February. And so just be patient with us as we navigate it. Like I said, it wasn't an easy decision. We thank you for your prayers and your encouragement, as many of you have reached out and uh, thanked us for making that decision to keep our community safe. So we will continue to be in this together, continue to pray for one another, and connect as much as you can, even if it's phone calls, emails, etc., during this time. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great! Is our God. God sing with me? How great is our God, and all will sing, sing how great, how great is our God. Age to age He stands, and time. Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, of the Spirit, Son, Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing. 
Every high and every low Remind me once again just who I am Because I need to know Ooh, You say I am love And I can't feel a thing You say I am strong You say I am 
When the music fades And all is stripped away Can I simply come Longing just to bring Something that is worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, and all I have is yours, every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song, because it's all about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song, because it's all about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song. More than a song, it's all about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song, more than a song. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus
eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes upon Jesus look Summerland Baptist Church. As you can see by the background, I represent yet another individual whom Brad is using to remotely stitch together our morning service this week. Not the way we anticipated starting out this week. And in fact, when we began the planning for the service, we were looking at uh, who was doing what and uh, that migrated to who wouldn't be there. And that's when we started to realize that a num the number of people, both amongst our volunteers and amongst our staff that are impacted either by um, restrictions because they're symptomatic or because of uh, actual positive test cases. So this represents hopefully a short-term three-week, uh, to use the expression we're getting tired of, the circuit breaker response to uh, slow things down. We're seeing uh, in our community a number of areas are impacted, everything from the thrift store to um, pickleball association, a number of different things that are coming in reported every day. It's preemptive as we didn't know who would be left standing on Sunday morning and even this morning received word of another staff member who was going to be sidelined because of symptoms. So I think we have much to pray about. We also have much to be grateful of, at least, at least verbally as these are reported, this particular round of symptoms is not nearly as severe. It does uh, seem to hang on for the individuals that are in our circle of influence that we've talked to anyways, but definitely not as severe um, for those we've talked to. Uh, in, uh, in, in true Pat fashion, I, uh, when I first, uh, was mulling over the impact of yet perhaps possibly more restrictions or self-imposed restrictions, I quietly walked into my office in dignified fashion, closed the door and went, Argh! I felt better after that, but that may capture some of your thinking, um, irritation to frustration to, uh, mild annoyance and everywhere in between. Uh, or perhaps you're glad that we're taking this uh, extra efforts. Um, I kind of was thinking forward in, uh, uh, you know, at Christmas time, it seemed as I was traveling, there seemed to be glimpses of hope as more freedoms were opening up among travel venues. And then things sort of started to come to a grinding halt again after Christmas. I was, uh, I looked as I did uh, for inspiration often to the words of uh, Darren McElvey and Every Moment Holy as, uh, and this time I was thinking where my heart should be going instead of, you know, kind of mulling over the frustrations that uh, um, that it's in. And I want to leave you with these thoughts in this prayer from McElvey instead of, um, is, is it sort of captured where I, I was thinking um, we should be emerging from a long frustration um, into a long sustaining hope. For I am learning, O Lord, how sorrow and hope were never enemies, but co-laborers. For it is sometimes the work of our grief to hew out our deep cisterns, where the sustaining waters of eternal hope must afterwards gather in a pool. I would relinquish now, O Lord, any lingering claim to bitterness, and instead submit my heart to the work of sorrow. So that in your hands these hallowed, hallowed spaces of love, pain, and memory would become hallowed spaces, holy places over which your spirit hovers and broods, crafting in me greater compassion and Christ-likeness 
and singing new hopes to life. You've carried me through the darkness of a desolate landscape, O God, and have today sent evidence of the slow rebuilding of my soul, my heart, and my hope. Now, perhaps your um, your thoughts may not be that quite that uh, morose, or um, or perhaps a new glimpse of hope isn't even on your radar yet. Um, but it truly is um, ever the I guess the the Christian message is one of hope. And so our hope and our trust is in Christ and amidst the everything from the frustrations to the annoyance to the sadness of our current circumstances. And it is our prayer, O oh Lord, that you would guide us in that hope and make us a minister of peace to our community. In Jesus' name, amen. And lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we sing, everyone sing. out of the Christmas season, I was trying to think about what kind of sermon series would be helpful for us as we start a new year. And I don't know about you, but with all of the different things that are happening in our world today, 
I thought maybe just a little bit of focus would be helpful. For the last two weeks, the staff has met together for what we call our January focus meetings. And they have a lot of different reasons why we do them. It's a time to reconnect, um, a time to focus in on staff health and how are we doing. Uh, we do a lot of devotionals and praying and getting into the word together. So that's always a real treat and a joy. Uh, and that's one of the purposes. One of the purposes is to think about our mission and our vision and where are we going and what does God have for us for not just this next year, but maybe for this next length of time, the next season of ministry that we're in. So we spent some time praying that through and, and uh, thinking about it and working it through. Um, and that was really, I think, really good. And we're not done that process. That was just the beginning of that. And then the third reason is some strategic planning of just thinking of the next year of when is Easter? What are the dates for those? Let's put those on the calendar. Uh, is there anything special that we want to do for that? Are there other events? Are there things that we want to do as a church community, um, even in light of the pandemic and some of the things that we can or can't do? Um, what are some creative ways to engage our church? And so we take some of this time to, to kind of re-engage that. And so as we spent time focusing strategically and long-term thinking and vision and mission and purpose and connecting as a staff, I thought this would also be a good time for us as a whole church just to stop and focus. You know, Arnold Palmer is a famous golfer. And I think even if you don't follow golf, you probably know who he is. Uh, he was nicknamed the King, one of the greatest golfers ever. Some say the greatest golfer of all time, but I think Tiger Woods probably unseated him off the throne of him and Jack Nicklaus in that argument on who was better. But Arnold Palmer, nonetheless, is still one of the greatest golfers of all time. And what made him great was when it came time to win a tournament, this guy knew how to close it out. And so he tells this story uh, in a Golf Digest article, and he was talking about the 1961 Masters tournament that he lost. And this is what he says. He goes, I was on the final hole of the 1961 Masters Tournament. I had a one-stroke lead and I hit, every, I hit an amazing, satisfying tee shot. I felt I was in pretty good shape. As I approached my ball, I saw an old friend standing on the edge of the gallery. He motioned me over, struck out his hand and said, congratulations. I took his hand and I shook it, but as soon as I did, I knew I lost my focus. On my next two shots, I hit the ball into the sand trap, then I put it over the edge of the green. I missed a putt, and I lost the Masters. You don't forget a mistake like that. You just learn from it and become determined to never do that again. And I haven't in the 30 years since. It was interesting to, to me to hear the story of Alan Palmer, how he said, just shaking someone's hand is all it took for him to take his eye off the ball, to take his eye off the prize, to lose focus. That's all it took was one little distraction and he lost the 1961 Masters. You know, for us, it's easy for us to take the eye off the ball these days. I think especially in the world that we live in right now, the pandemic, polarized politics, shifting views and opinions on everything from ethics to morality in our culture, not to mention that we had forest fires and flooding in the same year. You know, Carolyn wrote an amazing blog post this week, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, I would take the chance, or I'd take the opportunity to read it. Uh, it was really well done. And what she said in there, just something that caught me as I was even preparing and as I read, she goes, many of us are feeling bone weary and are looking for relief. It is easy for us to lose focus on what we should really be focused on because there are so many distractions, so many people even reaching out and saying congratulations for fill in the blank or so many people reaching out and saying, I can't believe you made that decision or I can't believe you think that way or even when you turn on the news and news anchors and news and news reports are all just about um, fantasizing or maybe making news reports just absolutely over the top big to catch our attention, to grab our focus, to say, hey, look at me. This is really important so that their ratings go up. And it's often very negative. And they'll say whatever they need to say so that you stay tuned in on what they're talking about. When I read through the scriptures, there are a few times where the scriptures call us back 
to a focus, but one that jumps out the most to me is in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, I want to read for us verses 1, 2, and 3. Whenever I start feeling like I have lost focus, whenever I feel like I'm feeling frazzled, or again, as Carolyn put it, I'm bone weary and I'm looking for relief, this is one of those passages that draws me back. And it is something that I had memorized a long time ago. It was something that now has stuck in my brain. And so when I was thinking about how do we refocus, how do we find a place where we can find relief from our bone weariness, this is a passage that came. So let's read it together. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, and we're just going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. And consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary, you will not lose heart. There's so many things in that passage that we can unpack. And really, for the next three and four weeks, we're going to unpack what's in this passage. It's going to be our anchor passage. We're going to look at it every single week because I think it's something that helps us, again, draw back and focus in. I even like the sports analogy that, that the author of Hebrews... Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews... There's always kind of the guess. It's the unknown author. Some people think Paul, but the language is really different from how Paul writes. But there is kind of this athletic um, passage in here where he talks about, like, let us run the race that's marked out for us. Let's focus on the prize. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. And Paul has said stuff like that in the past. So that's why some people think maybe Paul wrote this or maybe Paul wrote it with someone else. They're not sure. But Anyway, it doesn't really matter who wrote Hebrews. What I do is that this passage does remind me of how Paul writes and how he thinks. And what sticks out to me for today in talking about focus is where is our focus supposed to be? It's supposed to be on the end goal, to fix our eyes on Jesus. To fix our eyes on Jesus. But I don't know about you, but... Sometimes when I think about fixing my eyes on Jesus, that's one easy thing to say. But it's actually quite a difficult thing to do. It's an easy thing to say, but it's actually a difficult thing to do because what does that mean to fix your eyes on Jesus? Jesus did come and he walked in this earth. He was God with us. He was the Emmanuel. We just celebrated that at Christmas time. He did come to earth, but then he went back to be with the Father. And he promised that he's going to return again. But currently, he is not here physically. He is here in spirit. He sent the counselor, the spirit, to be our counselor and our guide. The spirit of God lives within us as we have become the temple of God, each one of us. So, all of those being true and that God is still with us, it's not that we can just physically look out and go, I'm now going to fix my eyes here specifically because Jesus isn't there. It is the Spirit. So how do you fix your eyes on something that you cannot see? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about just the practicality, the practicality of fixing our eyes on Jesus when we're feeling weary, when we're losing heart, when we are, and again, I love the phrase that Carolyn says, bone weary. I, that resonates with me. I know what she means when she says that. I am a tired weary of enough is enough, enough polarization, enough distraction. I want to get back to the source. I want to get back and focus in where I can find peace. And so there's a passage in Philippians, Philippians 4, 6 through 9, that I think draws us into how do we focus in on Jesus? And there are three things that come out of that passage that I think help us understand what does it mean to fix our eyes on Jesus, to focus on him. The first thing is prayer. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it says, Don't be anxious about anything, but rather bring all of your requests to God in your prayers and your petitions, along with giving thanks. 
And then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. So it's talking about this, we're, we're living in anxiety or we're living in a weariness or we're living in worry or we're living in full of distraction. And what's the first thing that, that Paul says here to the Philippians? Come to God in prayer. Bring it all. Bring your petitions, bring your thanksgiving, bring everything to him in prayer. I know that for me, when I really need to focus in, when I really need to say, hey God, I need to, to reset here. Do you know, prayer is probably the first thing that I go to. I have this rock in my office. And in hindsight, now that I'm standing here preaching in front of the camera, I should have probably brought the rock with me because it would have been a pretty easy prop for me. But I have a rock in my office. It's on my shelf. And it's where I put my keys every day. I intentionally put it there so that I could see it every day. And it's a reminder to breathe. When I was at the Arrow Leadership Conference and, and uh, intensive class that I took in October, and we went out to the coast on Keats Island, and we did a lot of different kind of soul care things. And one of the things they did was just a time of meditation prayer, of really focusing in on an attribute of God or focusing in on who God is. And so we were supposed to just kind of breathe in a word and then breathe out a truth and breathe in a word and breathe out a truth. And so mine was um, Holy Spirit. I breathed in and then I breathed, fill me with your presence. Um, and there was just, as I breathed in, I breathed in the word Holy Spirit. And then I breathed out, fill me with your presence. And I'm, I'm a Saskatchewan farm kid. I'm not, I'm not one for meditation. I'm not one for kind of experiential things. I'm pretty steak and potatoes, you know, simplicity of things. When I think of, of doing church, it's usually like I love singing a song and I love getting into the word and I love hearing a good sermon and then going home and, and putting it into practice. And, and anything that has an artistic feel to me, it always kind of pushes me a little bit. It pushes me into an uncomfortable zone. And so this idea of kind of this meditation is like I had to think that through a little bit. That's not my natural place. What I find fantastic is that Jesus takes this uncomfortable place that teaches me something that I've never really been comfortable with because I feel like, ah, I don't know, like has a new agey to me. But then actually does this amazing thing with it and brings me peace. And not because of the breath, Right? Not because of the, the action that I did, but because of, I think, the heart, the openness to say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive your peace. I want to feel your presence. I want to focus back in on just you. And so I breathe when I pray. That's the first thing. I breathe and I meditate on him. And then I talk honestly and openly with him. I don't know what your prayer life looks like, but the prayer life that that he's talking about right here is bringing all of your requests to God, your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Prayers and petitions, God, these are, these are my needs. This is what's going on. Now, he's fully aware of what's going on in our lives, but I know that as a pastor, sometimes when I'm in a group of people and I have to pray, I feel like maybe I need to be a little bit more pastoral. I have to have the right things to say. And maybe that creeps into my personal prayer life as well. And I just need to remember to be honest and to be open and to be authentic because God knows where I'm at. God knows where you're at and he wants to just hear from your heart. So when I first start and I breathe and I meditate just on the spirit, I meditate on Christ, I meditate on an attribute of God. And then from there I go into um, just being honest and here's where I'm at, Lord. Here's where the needs are. Lord, I'm feeling anxious. Lord, I am feeling thankful. Lord, I'm feeling filled up. I'm feeling grateful. There's all these things that I could be praying about, but I want to be open and honest with him. And then I take time and I listen. Now, I've never heard an audible voice from God. There are some that have, and I believe them. They, they, are, they are true. They are trustworthy people. They say they feel like they've heard from God. I have not, and I, and I don't think that's the norm. I think for many of us, maybe God speaks through our conscience. He speaks through thoughts that fly through our minds. Sometimes when we read the scriptures, something jumps off the page and we're like, that was for me today. Uh, Adele often shares the things that he reads in the morning. There's something that pops off the page for him that's just for him. 
And he's hearing from God. He's taking time to listen. And we need to take time to listen. I was on a phone call this week with someone who wanted to tell me a bunch of things. Um, and I just sat there and I listened. They had no interest in what I had to say. They just said everything. And then when they were done, they said, all right, have a great weekend. And that was the end. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I sometimes wonder if we're like that with God. We give our prayers and our petitions and we give our thanks. And we don't take time to listen to what maybe God has to say about all those things. The very concerns and the worries and the anxiousness and the distractions that we're bringing to him. He's like, actually, I have something to say about that. But we're so busy telling him all about those things that we don't stop to listen. So I think starting off, if we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, it starts with prayer. And there's lots of different ways to pray and there's lots of different places you can pray. I love that we can pray no matter where we are and we're to pray without ceasing. You could be going off for a walk. You could be alone in a room. You could be with a group of people and prayer is available to us. In the middle of a conversation, there are even times when I'm preaching, like right now and feeling a little bit drained and still not quite over being sick. I'm praying, God, give me the strength, sustain me, even as I'm preaching. I love that we have that open communication with him and that's a great place to start, to start fixing our eyes on him, to come to that place. You know, the second thing that comes out and in this scripture, we see it in Philippians 4, 8, it says this right after it says, um, understanding and keeping your heart's mind safe in Christ Jesus. It goes on and says, so from now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. So for me, when I think of that, when I think of, think of all, anything that is admirable, focus your thoughts on things that are true, holy, just, pure, lovely, and worthy of praise. Who does that sound like to you? If you were going to describe one person that fit all of that perfectly, now this is a Sunday school answer, so I'm expecting all of you in your living room as you're listening to this, if you're with a group of people, I want you just to count down and go, three, two, one. Did you say Jesus? Because you should have said Jesus right there. Three, two, one. Jesus! Wonderful Sunday school answer, but it's the right answer in this case. This is Jesus being described. The one that is true, the one that is holy, the one that is just, the one that is pure, the one that is lovely, and the one that is worthy of praise is Jesus. We are to focus on him. So how do we do that? He says, this is from now on, if anything is excellent, anything is admirable, focus on these things. How do we do that? Well, I would say we do that by getting into God's word. That the scripture is where we find out who Jesus is. The reason we know this describes Jesus is because we have the story of his life. We have the gospels where it explains his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection. We have the rest of the New Testament where the apostles then start unpacking some of that teaching and start saying, this is where Christ fulfills a lot of the things we read even in the Old Testament scripture. So then when we go to the Old Testament, we start seeing those attributes of Jesus and Jesus being foretold as the Messiah. And we start seeing all of these scriptures starting to link up and connect together. The Word, so this is the Word of God that we've talked about. This is the Word of God. It points to the Word. We were in our focus meetings this week and we had that came up in one of our conversations that that we don't worship the Bible. This is not something that we worship. We don't worship this book. But we worship the one this book points to. And that's it points to Christ. Points to God. And that's who we worship. But this does point to Christ. And so sometimes I think in our, in our worry that am I spending too much time worshiping the word? And am I worshiping this book? We want to almost take a step back from it and go... I don't, I don't think that this is important. I, I don't know if spending time in here, I think this, is, this has messed me up some. And I get that. I get that even as a church, sometimes we abuse this in ways that, well, sometimes it just makes me sad and makes me even a little upset. But what it doesn't, do, what I can't do then 
is then just throw the whole book away. Because this is what actually God gave us to point to him. And so it is important for us to, even with all of the the history of people taking verses out of context and abusing it in kind of weird and wonky ways, this verse is saying, I want you to focus in on the good things, the things that are true, the things that are holy, the things that are pure and just. I want you to focus in on the things that are worthy of praise. I want you to focus in on Christ. Find Christ in these pages. He's, these pages are pointing to him over and over again. The best way to know him is to learn about him, to know his story, to know what he taught. Why did he teach it that way? How does that break down? Why does that apply to us these days? You know, I, I find that I, I used to read in binges. I would I would get really get into it for a while. I would read books at a time. I was trying to think about how many times I've read through the scripture in its whole. Um, and I've, I've got to be double digits by now. Um, I started reading the Bible pretty young. And so by the time I even got to Bible college, I'd probably read it through a couple times. And then at college, you have to read it through a bunch of times just as a part of your, your studies. And then now that I'm a pastor and I'm, and I'm working through it and I've, I've done a lot of Bible studies and preaching and we've had to do readings and all, I probably have been through it double digits for sure. But even with all of that, there are times where, because maybe I've read it a lot, maybe because sometimes it does feel like it's boring. It's not as exciting as maybe the the exciting news report that's on or the exciting new movie that's out. It's just not quite the same. It's stories that I've already know. It's words I've already read. So then I tend to put it down and it tends to just sit on the corner of my desk, even as a pastor. So how much more is that true of that as everybody else? I think it's true of everybody. Everybody at times puts the scripture down and doesn't go back to it. And we need these focus reminder times to go, you know what? It is time. And there's lots of different ways we can interact with the scripture now. We're actually at a really cool time in history where the only time that people could hear the scripture early on was to go to the synagogue and have someone read it. And you would only have a portion of the scripture of the Old Testament. They wouldn't have all the books. They would only maybe only have five of the prophets. They might have the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They might have a couple history books, and then they might have a couple prophets and that's it. And then you'd have to go around to different synagogues to hear different parts of the scripture. It just wasn't available and you only ever heard it audibly. This wasn't until all of a sudden you get into, I think it's the late 1400s. Dell just looked it up this week, so that's how I know it off the top of my head. In the late 1400s, all of a sudden we have the printing press. The Bible gets put into its current form the way it is, and for the next 500 years, we now have it at least available to us. But really, now with the internet and online and this, you know, my phone right here, I have the Bible in all of its translations in this much space. That's it. Just this much space, and I've got all like volumes of Bible. All of this fits into there, but then like every single other version that I could possibly that has ever been written in the English language is in there as well. So I have this Bible app. It's called U Version Bible App. Maybe you have it. And I have set for a daily reminder of a Bible passage. And so every day the U Version app flashes right on my screen the verse of the day. So every day, I at least am reading that verse. And I did it because I was like, I want a daily reminder to be pointed back to Jesus. Not because it's a check mark box, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but not that it's this big check mark of, hey, I've done my Bible reading for today, but I actually, every day, I want to get pointed back to Jesus. I want him to be the center. I want him to be the focus. And so I have this little Bible app and it, and it points me to something. And then that sometimes spurs a thought. And so then I open up my scripture and then I read a little bit more context or I read the whole chapter. I might sometimes, even if it's a short book, I might read the whole book of the context of what that little verse that popped up. And then I get to dive into the scripture to prepare sermons or to, um, to, to think about long term as far as like small groups or Bible studies or things like that. I, I have the privilege of being a pastor and having to, having to, as part of my job, to dive into this. And I see it as a privilege. It is a privilege. And I'm so grateful for it. But all of us, pastor or not, need to be digging into the Word. To let the Word 
point us to the word, Jesus Christ. The last thing that comes in Philippians is community. Philippians 4.9 says this, Practice these things. Whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us, the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things. We were designed for community. We're one body. We're many parts. There's a part in the scripture that talks about and describes how we are as a church. That we're one body. We're all one unit. We're a community. But we are made up of many parts. And we're all necessary for each other. Just like, you know, the nose can't say to the ear, we don't need you. um, Because otherwise, how would we hear? Or the ear can't say to the eye, I don't need you. Because how would you ever see? In the same way, we are designed to be put together into one unit. We're designed for community and as we do things like teaching on a Sunday morning like right now as we start to unpack and as you get challenged by me to say hey what does it look like to focus to fix your eyes on Jesus as I'm learning this and I can think this through and pray about this and how's this impacting my heart and then as I share that with you that maybe impacts you and you start thinking about it so then you're going to share that maybe at coffee time this week with someone else or in a small group and go, what did you think of that? How do you connect? How do you fix your eyes on Jesus? And you start having other conversations and then that, that, that shapes them and it starts to shape their thinking. And then do you see how that works? Like we start, it's just kind of spreads out and we start learning and we realize that we are in this together. We're learning this stuff together. We learn from each other. We help each other grow. You know, Paul Cozen, who was a camp director that I worked for, and I've mentioned him a bunch of times. And in fact, I think I've even told this story where he had this um, object lesson that he did every summer and he did it every week of every summer. But he would take a log um, at the beginning of the campfire and just say, you know, this is the last campfire of the week. and You guys have had a really great week. And he'd take a log and he'd just put it out and put it to the side and it would sit there and smolder on its own. And then when he would, we would do all the singing and the speaker would speak and then he'd come back up and he would just say, you know, like earlier on, um, I took a log out of the fire and I don't know if you noticed that, but this week, a lot of you have, have come to know Jesus. You've come to focus your, fix your eyes on Jesus. You've come to know him for the first time or you've rededicated or you've, or at least grown in your faith. And you've done that because you're in a community, you're with a bunch of people that are doing the same thing. And so together you're able to focus better because you're, you're drawing strength from each other in that focus. And so then he would go on and he'd talk about the importance of staying together, staying in the fire um, of Jesus. He says what happens is, is you're going to go home for some of you aren't going to have a church or a place where you can plug into to be a part of a community that's seeking after Jesus. And so you're going to be on your own and you think, well, I can just do it by myself. And he says, and you're going to be a lot like this log. And he said, and he would reach down with his bare hand and he would pick up that log that he had already taken out. In the time that that campfire had gone on, the log went from burning to cold enough that he could pick it up with his hand every time. Every time it also maybe went. So I was like, oh, he's going to burn his hand this time. Nope, not that time. It's every time it was cool enough and he would pick it up and then he would set it back in the fire and immediately it would ignite. And he says, we need each other. We are designed to do life together. And when we're feeling frazzled, when we're feeling um, unfocused, when we're feeling like we are weary to our bones, I wonder sometimes if that means maybe we're just feeling a little isolated. Maybe we have stepped away from accountability. Maybe we've stepped away um, from group Bible teaching. Maybe we've stepped away from, from sharpening each other and listening to each other. And being a part of that community, how we've designed, how we were designed to be. Now, I recognize that it's kind of funny for me to say that on a Sunday where we're now not meeting together again. And I get it. And listen, I'm the first one to tell you, I think meeting together physically is really important. We were designed to live that way. Now, we are in a small piece of time where this is going to have to do. And I'll be honest. Listening online, listening to teaching, singing, just just at least taking in a little bit is better than zero. Because right now, there's a lot of other people that are listening to the same thing. And if you can connect with them this week and have a conversation about it, then we are still doing this as a community. Oh, it's not quite the same as when we're in the building together. I get it. And I, and I agree. But this is the best we can do right now. 
And so we embrace it and we go, okay, what can I do then to connect with someone else on what we've learned today? How could I be an encouragement? How can I come alongside and walk with someone? I mean, our mission statement right now says following Jesus together. That's the really important part is that we are following Jesus. He is our focus and we do it together. Consistent community will help us stay focused on him. As long as we are a community that does stay focused on him, we need to be Jesus-centered. You know, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we come to realize that he's had his eyes on us the whole time. You know, as we read Psalm 23, and we read Psalm 23 this week um, as a staff, uh, we actually read it yesterday, today's Friday, that I'm, that, I'm, uh, that I'm preaching this on the video to get it ready for Sunday. And on Thursday morning, we read Psalm 23, and you said it, we read it in a bunch of different versions, and uh, there's a few things that popped up. But one of the things that popped up, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters, and he guides me in paths of righteousness. And then near the end, it says, And surely goodness and love will always follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The idea is that he has been walking with us this whole time. And even when we start feeling like we are frazzled and even though we feel like we are distracted and even though we feel like our focus is on something completely else, the whole time Jesus is right there and he's just waiting and he's looking. He's holding his hand out as that gracious shepherd waiting for us to turn and fix our eyes on him. And the moment we do that, the moment we fix our eyes on him, he reaches out and he grabs our hand. This week, the challenge, I think, in the homework assignment isn't just to do the checklist. I want everyone to pray at least five times. I want you to get in your Bible every day. Uh, and I want you to reach out and talk to at least four people from our church. And if you do all those check boxes, then you're clearly the holy ones of our church. Nope, that's, that would be an easy homework assignment. And for those of you who love to fill in check lists. I, I understand it. I get it. That's an easy one. But that just seems like that's not quite exactly right. I think the check boxes, when, when we start reading the scripture as just something I need to check off a list, it's void of the relationship. If I'm going to the scripture every day because I'm actually seeking Jesus, because I actually want to know him, because I want to be with him, well, then that's different, isn't it, than just simply checking off a box. If I'm coming to prayer because I know that that's the right thing to do and I've got a long list of, of needs that God needs to address, well, that's a little bit like putting the quarter in the old Coke machine and, and hoping to get some, some uh, answers back. But if I'm going to him to just simply be in his presence, if I'm going to him in prayer because I'm in a genuine relationship with him, well, then that's different, isn't it? If I'm in community because that's just all I've ever known, it's, you, just, you just go to church. That's how I was brought up and that's what I will do to the end of my days. And you just simply do it as, a, again, I watched church this week or I was kind of connected with a few people this week and that's great, check mark, great, I'm a good Christian. Well, I think that's missing it. But if we're genuinely concerned for each other, if we really want to be in an intimate relationships with each other to, to say, you know what, there are times where we're going to disagree on how to do things, but I'm still going to love you like a brother and like a sister. And I'm going to come alongside you. And even in our disagreement, I'm going to make sure that you're okay. And we're going to seek after Jesus together. And we're going to discern together what is the path forward. Well, then that's different, isn't it, than a checkbox. So this week, what I want you to do is I want you to just maybe discern the attitude of your heart. Are you getting into the word? Are you praying? Are you engaging in community because of the right reasons? Or is it just simply a checkbox? I'm not a big fan of fake it till you make it, especially when it comes to reading the scripture or prayer or living the Christian life. I've never really been a great big fan of that. I'm actually much more of the God transform my heart. Give me a passion to do these things, not because they are in of themselves holy, 
but because you are. And I want to know who you are, and I want you to transform my life. I want to be fixed on you and you alone. I don't want to be distracted by the things of this world. Lord Jesus, I want to keep my eyes fixed solely on you. So there's maybe a homework assignment or a challenge for you this week. Again, praying for you all. I'm hoping that you are okay, that you're safe. I know that Bree and I and the family, we are, we're on the mend. And uh, praying that you are continuing to be safe and you're well. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week. God bless. He's for you, he's for you, he's for you.